All right. We are cooking with gas now. And oh, yes, my little app thing on the side fell off. So everyone, welcome. This is a conversation series on uh, my YouTube channel. Big surprise. If you're watching it, you have to be on my YouTube channel. And we are with a longtime friend, somebody I've been so anxious to talk to you for a long time because I haven't talked to you in a long time, is, is photographer, photojournalist David Buto. How are you doing today? I'm doing great, Dan. And I just should point out that I'm wearing a G23 t-shirt in your oh, honor. Oh, no way. I can't really see it, but I'm like, yeah, I had to bust this out this morning. So, And that is, by the way, a nice t-shirt. It's, it's a very, you, I, I was impressed with the, the time that you must have uh, put into sourcing the t-shirt because it's like super well designed and it, it like fits perfectly. And yeah, it's like a top quality t-shirt just on its own. Even Sans logo would be a good t-shirt. So yeah, it's one of those, not like those American kind of circus tent t-shirts that, you know, are 14 sizes too big and they're built like a giant square. Right. Um, these are, and that is, that is 100% due to my, uh, co-editing partner, Rick Elder was the one that sourced those t-shirts. So he, he is a master. He's, he's, is primarily the reason that AG 23 exists. We can talk about that later. If you want, I have huge plans for that this year. It's sort of been in a holding pattern for a while. It's driving me crazy. It's like a creative thorn in my side when I wake up in the morning that that is not further along and also more, more than it is right now. But let me give people a little rundown on you because I don't know. I kind of think that photojournalism, photojournalists in particular are a completely misunderstood group of people, but you are a photojournalist. And I just learned that you're also a drone pilot, which is kind of cool. You're also a guitar player, if I remember correctly. And most importantly, you graduated from the University of Texas, which proves your pedigree of just like mm -hmm. the 1% of the 1% because only the best people in the world graduate from UT. Uh, and just to give a little sample here for people, you have worked in Afghanistan, which is no joke, Myanmar, uh, Iraq, Peru. You did stories on post 9-11 New York, Palestine, Israeli Intifada. You covered the 2003 invasion of Iraq. Again, hardcore, serious things. China earthquake in 08. Funeral of Nelson Mandela, the Hong Kong protests in 2019, which also looked pretty dicey. And you spent the last five or six years or so covering Capitol Hill and politics in D.C., which led to something truly remarkable that we're going to talk about in a moment, which is your book called uh, Brink. You've won World Press, Pictures of the Year, Photo District News, National Press Photographers Association, White House News Photographers, American Photography Annual, Com Arts. Basically, you're a jerk. You're trying to hoard all of these prizes and awards. I mean, dude, that's quite a lineup. And I think most importantly for me is you're a photographer, not necessarily an influencer. You know, you are a legitimate full-time working photojournalist and, and with an incredible track record. So I appreciate you taking time to, to talk with me. It's great to see you, Dan. It's been a few years, but it's nice to see you this way. So absolutely good to connect again. Before we get to the speed round, there's one question I have to ask, and if you remember this. In 1996, American Photo ran a cover story called, Is Photojournalism Dead? And it was a black and white uh, – it was a woman who was photographing in the, in the Balkans, I think, was the cover image. And all of these – you know, they were like, is photojournalism dead? This was 96 in American Photo. And I remember that most of the the responses, if I had to gauge them overall, were like, not looking too good. You know, and there was always, you know, like the doom and gloom. But the last comment I remember was from the the guy who founded SEPA. His first name was like Gok Goskin. Um, I don't know if you ever met him. He was a oh. very very eccentric dude, cool guy. Hmm. He was Turkish and he started SEPA Press. And he hmm. wrote this quote that was like it, it just basically took the rest of that story and article and just shoved it off the table because it was so like it was magical in the sense of like saying as long as there's people out there who are hungry to investigate what's happening in the world, photojournalism is not going anywhere. And so mm -hmm. I, I do you remember that issue. And because it had to be relatively early in your career. Mm -hmm. Do you remember that thing? I, I vaguely I remember that idea being discussed a lot during that time. And I, you know, I don't, I don't, I'm not sure what the catalyst for, for all that discussion was, but, you know, it went on for a few years and sort of when the web started and then when a lot of online media went to video or video was a big part of that sort of communication, a lot of people were saying, well, maybe photojournalism isn't dead, but still photography is dead. And all photographers are going to need to learn video because no one's going to want to look at still pictures anymore. So, and, <laughs> you know, it's almost like the opposite turned out to be true. So, yeah. Yeah. 
I remember being at the paper in uh, working in newspapers in the early 90s and they were like multimedia is going to save us and mm. and when the newspapers went from color to, to from black and white to color it was under the guise of the audience is too sophisticated for black and white. But as a young like newspaper photographer, I would encounter people in the field literally on a weekly basis that would say, what happened to the black and white? I don't want color. I love black and white. And I mm -hmm. just remember thinking that the management at the paper seemed to be completely out of touch with the actual audience. And I knew <laughs> that multimedia was not going to save anyone. But before we get into the questions, I've got a speed round that I want to hit okay. here just to get you okay. like, you know, mm -hmm. limbered up. Right. Okay, great. And uh, okay, so how many seconds uh, per answer uh, do I get? You can take your time, but it's just, you know, I, there'll be pretty simple answers, I think, which is question one is window or aisle? Oh, aisle. Oh, me too. I could, I don't know. I never sit in the window. You're trapped. Uh, American exactly. photo magazine or French photo magazine? French photo magazine. Of course. Why? Because we're both left handed. <laughs> We're left-handed and French photo was, to me, was like the adult in the room. It wasn't that I didn't like American photo, but the first time mm. I saw like injured American GIs and nudity in a photo magazine was in French photo. And I was like, well, what happened to American photo? There was so much censorship. And it was really, to me, like a, an eye-opening experience when I first saw French photo. I was like, whoa. Yeah, that. And I'll, I'll just add, I mean, I, th I think the, you know, the French tradition of photojournalism, I mean, it goes, it goes deep. Maybe it goes right all the way back to, you know, Cartier-Bresson, but it's, it's still part of the, their culture, which is so great. Great Perpignan, perfect example of that visa pour l'image, you know. So yeah, yeah, um, and we can talk about that in a minute. Uh, for those of you who don't know, uh, visa pour l'image is a photojournalism festival that happens once a year. I think it's in September in southern France, and it really mm -hmm. is a who's who. It's a collective of all the major players in photojournalism, from the actual photographers to the in industry people, the agencies. Um, I used to go every year, um, and the stories we had. It was such a blast to go to that. But next question in the speed round is glossy or matte. Matt. Yes. I hope that goes straight to the management at Blurb. Matt, <laughs> as in Matt covers on all of our magazines and trade books would be nice. Okay. Last speed round question, Fender or Gibson? I actually own neither of those guitars, but I'm going to say Gibson. And what guitars do you own? Well, I, ha I have an Epiphone, which is, okay. which is sort of the, the consumer version of the Gibson. And yep. I have a Rickenbacker bass and a Yamaha acoustic guitar. So I have I mean, a Yamaha. Fender's great. I mean, I'm just, I've just never been a, a, a Fender person. I've just never had a Fender, but nothing against Fender. But no, no, know. I get it. I, I, the same thing. I have a, a Yamaha acoustic electric. Um, and my brother plays a Gibson Les Paul that he's had since like 1975, and he still has it and plays it every day. See, uh, I know, suck. New page, you know, Les Paul. I mean, come on. Oh yeah. So, yeah. Okay. On to the meat of this, uh, the, the crux of this conversation. Mm. When you went to UT, you, you were a government major. Mm. What we government to me, historically in ed, American education was a single class that said there's three branches of government. Here they are, memorize them, move on. What right. the heck is a government major? Well, and you, what is that? Well, it's basically a political science major. So at, at UT Austin, for whatever reason, they didn't have a political science department. So no one had ever said poli sci. It was called government. But it is a, it's the same, uh, uh, basically. So, and, yeah. And you're an intelligent guy. Why that? Of all the majors at UT, you could have done Latin American studies. You could have done engineering. You could have done pre-med. Why, why poli sci? Well, those last two, I, I would have flunked out my first semester. So there was no, no question about that. But um, I was, you know, I was interested in current events when I was in high school. I think that's when that sort of developed for me. And, you know, my interest in photography was happening simultaneously, but there wasn't really any merge of the two until later, maybe when I was about a senior in high school. But I, I went to UT in part because they had a great tradition of, of sort of putting out really good photojournalists. You know, a couple of Pulitzer Prize winners, you know, Skeeter Hagler, Larry Price, people like that, who'd gone on to do great things. And uh, they had a you know great student newspaper. Um, so I, I was sort of thinking along that track, but I ended up in the, the School of the Liberal Arts, partly just because my parents insisted on it. And then of all the classes that I was taking, I, I liked the poli sci classes the most. And it 
I, I'm not sure that it really hit me at the time, but having that kind of background, sort of a broad background, understanding public policy, that that worked really well after I left college and then started working as a photojournalist. It was sort of a good intellectual, you know, foundation for some of the things I'd, I'd end up doing. So, so did you take photojournalism classes at UT? I took one, I took two photo photo classes total and they were both kind of like the history of photography and okay. one was in the humanities department so it was sort of like photography you know as it evolved and what that meant in sort of the historical sense of the times as things were changing with the craft and then i took one sort of straight up photojournalism history class in that department so yeah th that's all the, yeah that's, that's the interesting. Of my professional uh, formal training so would you say that 80 the percentage was 80 20 poli sci to photo in terms of classes but what percentage was occupying your brain was it i'm, I'm doing a poli sci major but i know i'm going to go on to be a photographer or was photographer photography still like a smaller parallel path or did you know at that point i think i knew at that point i think i that, that, that's what I, I i knew that's what i wanted to do and in fact i sort of couldn't wait to get out of college i wasn't I mean, there were some classes that I loved, but in a sense, to me, that was just, it was almost like just in my way. I mean, there were some things, great things that I learned at school, but, um, you know, fortunately, when I was a senior in high school, I got on a school program. I grew up in Dallas and um, I got on a school program where the second half of my senior year, I did an internship at the Dallas Morning News in their photo department. So when I went to Austin, it was great because I became like a stringer for the morning news while I was in college. Yes. Yeah, so that's really like what I wanted to do was just, so that's what I was thinking about all the time. I like going, I like photographing the football games and, you know, so yeah. Stuff what what year, model. what year did you graduate? 87, 19, 1987. Just okay. So I graduated high school in 87, UT in 92 with a PJ major. Right. And the guys who were, the two people who were before me that really jumped out were John Moore, yeah. And who was also doing the same thing. He'd gone to school at UT, but he was stringing and shooting for like AP or something on the side. Mm -hmm. And then mm -hmm. McConico did the same thing. McConico and they and John Moore, I think, still works for AP. And I think McConico is too. Last time I talked to him, which was a long time ago. And then there were other guys and I did a similar thing, but I wasn't, I was freelancing on the side for like anybody that would hire me. But I also was working with the Austin fire department photographer, who is this guy that befriended me one night at a scanner and I was driving around East Austin, like shooting the mayhem, um, you know, in the middle of the night. And he came up to me, he was wearing a suit and tie and he was like, you know, what are you doing? Who are you? And I said, oh, I'm a photo major. And he had an amazing lab at the fire department and taught me how to print color. And like, he was, or his name was Erwin Haddon. He was just the nicest guy in the world. Um, one question uh -huh. about this is, I was a photojournalism major, but I minored in Spanish and anthropology. So I totally get your idea and your feeling about poli sci was going to help you in ways down the road. And I felt the same way about anthropology. I think it was one of probably the most important part of my education was anthropology, mm -hmm. then Spanish, then photography. But when I was a junior, um, I had not declared a major. And the, and the school wrote me and said, you can't come on campus again ever unless you declare a major. So I was like, okay, I'll do uh, photojournalism. But it, I, when I was a junior, I realized that there was a photography major in the art department. And I was, mm -hmm. you know, photojournalism, I don't know how you felt about it, but there were tons of rules, you know, and ethics involved in photojournalism. The photography d department in the art department, there were no rules. And I ran mm -hmm. into a major a photography major and he told me what he was working on. And I was like, oh my God, there's this whole other like fine art aspect of photography. I'd never even considered did you know that that was an option as well? I tell you, I did not know it until you just told me. <laughs> which I, you know, so I, I wonder if they even had that when I was uh, in school there, because if yeah. I'd known about it, I probably would have, you know, tried it. Because I think in some ways it's taken me a long time, but in some ways I, I almost wish that I had injected a little bit more of that disruptive uh, rule breaking mentality earlier, earlier in my career. So I'm kind of envious that you found that and you did that. Uh, I, you know, I didn't transfer into that major, but I, it just haunted me for the rest of the time because I feel exactly like you. And looking back on it now, you know, when people ask me about the current state of photography, I think to me, the, one of the most 
upbeat, empowering, interesting genres left is the fine art world, the actual mm -hmm. fine art world of photography that sort of runs parallel with the art world. And and you can basically do whatever it is you want. I, I always look down on conceptual photography, I think, because I was such a strict like photojournalism guy. But it, that's my mistake. It's on me because I realize now how interesting and and yes, there maybe there's people working in conceptual art that are writing on concept more than the quality of the work, but there's a ton of people who aren't. And I look at fine art now as much as I do any other genre because I think it's a really interesting group. So when you graduated from UT, and by the way, just on a side note, the lineup, the staff at the Dallas Morning News at the time was just world class badass list of photographers. Ken Geiger and who was Geiger's like partner in crime? Uh, William Snyder. Schneider, and then you had Judy Walgren was yeah, there. Judy, and, I mean, Jan, uh, Jan Sonnenmeyer was there. Uh, oh, I didn't know that. I didn't know Jan was there at the time. She was there at the time. I mean, this was th some of the people that you're talking about. This was a little bit um, just after, like, I think I did after my high school experience, I think I, I did two summer internships there and then went on uh, to other places before I graduated you know, but um, that was that was when the staff went from being really good to truly exceptional. Like there was just, you know, yeah, it was amazing. So, yeah, I, you just knew that at any major story happening, there was going to be a morning news person there. And it was something that as you know, I was a intern in the at the Arizona Republic. I was like watching every single thing of, mm -hmm. of what everyone at the at the morning news was doing. So mm -hmm. you graduate. What's the plan? The plan was in my head was I wanted to be a newspaper photographer. That was sort of the scope of my um, ambition in a way. And uh, I, I think maybe just a combination of I had a little bit of experience having done these internships and then maybe the job market was pretty good. So that summer, right after I graduated, I had a couple of job offers within like two weeks after I graduated, which made my dad very happy. So he knew that I wasn't going to be staying in the house for too much longer. And uh, I got a job at the L.A. Times um, in their one of their suburban bureaus. And it wasn't like a full blown staff position. It was a, what they called a traineeship at the time. It was a two year program where they were basically they were rolling in dough at the time and they were expanding their suburban bureaus and they just needed people to work. So they needed people who had some experience, but they weren't going to pay them a ton of money. Uh, just as they would, you know, uh, you know, someone who had 10 years of pro experience or whatever. So, yeah, so I was it was like a dream for me to to come here where I'm sitting at this very moment in L.A. and start my career, you know, in this amazing city. It was fantastic. So when my father would introduce me to his friends, he would he would say, this is my friend, my son. He's a freelance photographer, mostly free little Lance. <laughs> And because he was the same way, like, because my father said to me, photography is a hobby. It's not a job. He just like right. hated photographers. When a photojournalist would get hurt or killed somewhere in the world, he would, he would clip out the newspaper clipping, mail it to me with his scribble over the top. Like this idiot probably deserved it. Like that's, that was his wow. support from the photo side. Wow. But what, what bureau did you end up in LA? So the uh, uh, two bureaus, uh, uh, Ventura County and uh, sort of the San Fernando Valley Bureau. So I was in the uh, you know, Chatsworth and the Valley, but the Ventura Bureau was really. So I split my time between those two places. The Ventura Bureau was a uh, it came out once a week. They had a supplement and that was probably the most fun because I was the only photographer in that bureau and they had just opened it. So all stories like they hadn't done any stories there that, you know, that much. So any idea we had or the, you know, the reporters were young like me. And so we were come up with, you know, some let's let's uh, charter a helicopter and fly out to one of the Channel Islands because we heard there's some seals out there or something. Let's go check that out. And they were like, yeah, just go do it. You know, so it was, it was fantastic. And was this were you shooting transparency or negative? Um, well, I was shooting originally, you know, it was black and white and then and then color pretty soon. So color neg. You know, I had started shooting transparency at the morning news. Like that's all they had when I was, yeah. which is an incredible way to learn, right? When I was in high school um, and, and college, but at, at uh, the times it was uh, negative. Yeah, there's nothing to quite pucker you up more than transparency on deadline with an editor screaming at you not to come back to the paper if you missed it. And I think that's a hard thing for, I think, younger 
photographers or really any photographer that hasn't worked in the journalism world. I think for me personally, I don't know if there's a better training ground to be an all around photographer than the newspaper community to be under that pressure on a daily deadline again and again and again. I don't think newspaper photographers get their credit. I just don't think it's considered sexy like some of the other genres. But I mean, for you, for, I know for me, I was like petrified because I had my degree from UT. I got an internship at the Arizona Republic. I showed up. Uh, a, a guy threw a bag of equipment at my head the first day, another photographer. That was interesting. Um, and then, you know, at the end of the first week, the photo editor goes, Hey, I need you to fly to Alabama and go find Charles Barkley's family and try to spend the playoff games with them in their house. And wow. I was too, I was too young to rent a car. So they had to rent a car for me. I just drove to this little town in Alabama and I was going block by block, like asking people where Charles Barkley's family lived. The cops pulled me over. What are you doing? I mean, I, and they, <laughs> I had no idea what I was doing, but within a six month time frame. I was like, I guess you could say photographically fit, you know, mm -hmm. I, I could, I could perform under duty. Was it the same for you in the sense of like, you had your system down? Yeah. I mean, I can't say that I had the system down. I mean, I mean, uh, flawlessly, I made so many mistakes, you know, over the years was starting, you know, when I was, you know, 16, 17 years old even. Um, but I think, you know, to your point though, I mean, it's great. It's a great, you know, training ground as a photographer, but also just as sort of like a person. I think, you know, because and, and someone who, you know, if you have to figure something out just on the fly or you're trying to, uh, you know, understand bureaucracy or understand the subtleties of working in a neighborhood that you're not familiar with. I mean, that's the best training ground for something like that. And I think just the the variety of experiences that you have when you're working for a newspaper, it's kind of I, I, I mean, I, I think it's great no matter what you end up doing. Um, so. Did, yeah. did you ever find yourself in, in any kind of questionable ethical scenarios to make photographs? Because I don't think one thing that I think it's lost on a lot of people is the pressure that you're put on under to deliver. And so mm -hmm. historically, I look back at some of the early things I covered. I covered like the political conventions in Houston in the 92, I think, and then San Diego 96. I saw photographers doing completely and utterly unethical things to get pictures. And I was sort of put in position several times, not, not by the paper itself, but like some of the freelance clients I was doing where I was like, Oh, this is not cool. And I just said to him, not cool. I'm not doing that. Did you, was that ever a part? Did you run into that? Well, I, I tell you, it's that, you know, it's a good point because I, I feel very lucky to have started my career working in newspapers because and for good for good newspapers. You know, before I graduated from college, I worked for the Morning News, uh, the you know, the Des Moines Register and the Chicago Tribune. Yeah. And then I started working at the L.A. Times and all of those papers are top flight with really good ethical standards. So that was just you know, just by osmosis. I mean, that was kind of imposed on me in the beginning. And I remember even when I was, I was probably, you know, 16 or 17 years old working at the morning news. And I had this assignment to photograph a restaurant and um, I, I shot a picture from the outside and they, or maybe from the inside or something. And there was a neon sign that had the name of it, but in my picture, it was backwards. So I turned the negative around and made a print. And when my boss, Richard Pruitt saw that he was the guy that hired me. He was the director or photography at the morning news at the time and i've been in touch with him recently anyway and he just like i mean he practically beat me to a pulp right there in the newsroom for trying to turn that picture in so that that's a like a hard but a good lesson right off the bat about ethics so yeah. I, I had that foundation and that i think that served me really well um when i you know when i left newspapers a few years later which we'll talk about and started working for magazines because i think the you know the ethics in that in that environment i found a little squishier so yeah yeah i think you know when i started at the paper as an intern they said things like if you get the name wrong on a caption you will not come back to the paper if mm -hmm. you if you make a journalistic error, if you make a written error that's in the AP style book, you will not come back to the paper. There, mm -hmm. there was a line in the sand, which mm -hmm. basically just terrified me. And mm -hmm. I was like – and also too, I, I never felt that I was in a position where I said, I can't make something from this. I don't need to like cheat here. I can uh, – if I'm smart and I and I work hard enough, I'll be able to do that. So it's, it's interesting. And I think that sort of uh, – the ethics of photojournalism – even though I haven't worked in that field 
forever, you know, 30 years or whatever. It just never goes away when you're in the mm-hmm. field. So another question I have about this time frame, because I, I have a sinking suspicion it might be slightly different today, which is I was explaining this to someone the other day that when I started, even as an intern, I had a full press credential from the Arizona Republic. And when I went into the field and photographed civilians, if you will, there was a that press pass came with a weight to it. It had relevancy. They they looked without saying anything, it was understood that I had been trained and vetted mm-hmm. and represented a journalistic organization. Number mm-hmm. one, did you feel that? And number two, all these years later, is that still I feel like we've slid. We we we've we've kind of gotten away from that. But what was it like for you? I think that's right. And there were, you know, I remember a couple of times um, early in my career, and maybe this is even going back to like high school and college again, when um, I was re- reminded, I was trying to get something done out in the field or, or you know, trying to get so, and it, and I was interacting with people and it, you know, I, I, I would be, I guess in those days, we didn't have cell phones, but I might be on the walkie talkie or on the payphone talking to my boss. <laughs> and, you know, and I was explaining to him what was going on. And I was reminded that like, I'm a representative for the paper. And so, um, you know, yeah, if you have that press pass with the organization's name on it, you know, it, it does come with a, you know, it's a validation, but it's also comes with some responsibility. And I still take that very, I still take that very seriously. And I think kind of maybe what you're talking about now is because, you know, the media landscape has just gotten so much more diffuse. And so, um, you know, a press pass could be a press pass could be just some organization that just makes something up and says press, you know, puts thing that says press on it, you know, so that's different from like, maybe being vetted by the police department or whatever, you know, I think there's a difference there. Yeah, I mean, I can remember distinctly Mm -hmm. many times going in the field and at being at some sort of event, if you will, not not officially thing where you had to pass through security, whatever, but just like something happening in the community. Mm -hmm. And someone would see that press credential and say, hey, this guy's from the paper. And it it, Mm -hmm. just like doors opened. And I mean, people committed crimes in front of you Mm -hmm. because they were like, oh, you're with the paper. Fine. And then they would do these things. And you're like, oh, my God, I can't believe they're letting me do this. Right. Now, now I feel like, and I'm not affiliated, but I don't shoot that kind of work and I do doc work. But when I go into the field and people, you know, ask me, there's a, far more suspicion today than there yes. was back then. But I think Wait. that's probably societal. Absolutely. It's societal and it's, you know, I mean, uh, yeah, there's, there's way more suspicion. And I think that's, I mean, I'm sure we're going to get to this later, but I think it sort of speaks to kind of the balkanization of the media, which is, I, I think, you know, and then, you know, in some ways there's there's a democratization, but the balkanization part where me, certain media organizations are affiliated with like a particular point of view, uh, that's different. That's really a different experience from, I think, when when we started. Yeah, I mean, I think I just I just heard a talk. Um, uh, I can't remember who was giving the talk, but he said 93 percent of Fox viewers vote Republican and 95 percent of MSNBC pr- uh, vote Democratic. And it's it's not really journalism. It's more like political theater for, for profit kind of thing. So and I think that has polarized. I think now when I go in the field, people are always like, who are you with? Who are you with? And oddly enough, when you say I'm not with anybody, I'm just doing this personal project, it actually can make it more difficult. And and, oh. and people are like, you're making money off of me. And it's like, no, I'm actually losing money doing this. And then they're like, okay, now this really doesn't make sense because who would do this and lose money? And I'm like, me. And then they go, no, no, you can't be here. So I'm I'm glad to know I'm not alone, that this is no, happening you're too well. Not alone. No, no. So tell me about um, – there's two things I want to talk about next. One is your first real real assignment where maybe it's – and this ties into what um, – this question is, what was the path? Because one of the things that existed at the time that you came out that doesn't really exist anymore was newspaper. So let's let's even go back further. Let's go internship, newspaper job, meaning staffer, or in your, in your case, working in when the bureau is under your two-year thing and then potentially going on to be a staffer. And then editorial freelance on the side until you had established yourself. Then you leave the paper, go editorial full time. Then you start dabbling in commercial in addition because there's more money in commercial while doing editorial. And then ultimately, if you can snag advertising where the real money lives while still doing uh, editorial, was that the path that you thought about? Was that something you wanted to do? And is that, in fact, the path that you did do? 
No, it's not the path that I did do. I think at some point, um, it seemed, you know, it was maybe after I'd been working in newspapers for, or excuse me, as a freelance magazine photographer for several years, I started thinking about more of that commercial advertising path just because of the financial payoff. But I found it was almost like a completely separate career. And yeah. it, and in order to do that, it was, it was almost like I was going to have to give up my work as a photojournalist just because the mindset and the workflow was so different. So, I mean, fortunately, I, I ended up getting a few gigs kind of in that sphere, but it didn't become a full, it, you know, it never became a full-time thing for me. Well, that's, you know, it's, I find that rather commendable because it easy, it's easy, it's so easy in photography to get sidetracked into something that you don't love that pays financially pays really well. I've done it several times in my career. Thankfully, it's been a long time in the past, but I definitely was like, you know, I'd be in the middle of shoots, like having that parallel conversation in my head, like, what the heck are you doing? Why are you doing this? And then you're looking over at the dollar signs going, I know why. And I think, I think that's like, running your battery down because you just look at it and at some point something snaps and you go, I can't do this anymore, but you stuck to photojournalism. And that's, that to me is a really interesting wrinkle, which also tells me that it's completely and utterly in your blood. I think once you, you kind of, uh, journalism is a really hard thing to shake the sound of the newsroom. Remember the days of the, of the, they weren't typewriters, but they were like word processors and they had the like, clicky clack mm -hmm. keys. Yeah. It's a what great was, sound and that buzz. And yeah, I think, I think if it's in your, I think if it's, it gets in your system at an early age and there's something about your personality and the things you're interested in, I think it's always there. And so, you know, it's, I, I mean, the, you know, the landscape has changed. We'll talk about that later. It has gotten more difficult and there's some frustrations, you know, just the, of the sorts of things that we were talking about, but, but but that the love, the love is still there. And um, yeah, I don't think that ever goes away. You know, you're cursed, Buto. Yeah, I, I, that's how I feel, too. So yeah. what what was the first assignment that you said you finally said to yourself, man, I am like I landed as a magazine guy like this is I feel like I've, I've done this or was it a combination of that? And the next question is about U U.S. News and World Report was sort of your affiliate and you were i'm assuming under contract with us news and world report but what was the first assignment where you said man i think i really did something good here yeah you know um it it wasn't like a super um a super involved or sexy assignment but when i when i uh basically quit newspapers i had a job at another newspaper in la for a year and i i just i i was frustrated with it and and in fact what happened was is that time magazine um, needed a picture that I had shot for that paper. And so they called me, you know, I, I don't know that I'd ever had a picture maybe once or twice in a magazine before, but time called me and said, Hey, could we get a copy of this? And the paper said, fine. And that ran and, you know, in addition to time. And then I was sort of like, well, wait a minute, if my pictures are good enough to be in a magazine, you know, why am I here? So I, I quit my job at that point. And one of the, so, and, and in fact, I, I, I met, Martha Bardak, who you know, oh, she's a gem. Right? She is a true gem. And at the time, she was the West Coast, you know, the Los Angeles based West Coast photo editor for Time magazine. So I was about maybe 25 years old and I went to see her and we began a professional relationship for a couple of years. It was just fantastic. And one of the first assignments she gave me was photographing um, Marines. Uh, who'd been veterans of the first Gulf War. So whatever George H.W. Bush, whatever year that was, probably like 91 or 92. So I went down to Oceanside, California, which is where Camp Pendleton is. And I went to a bar, I think it's called Jarhead or something. It's probably still there. I can't remember. But anyway, they wanted just these vets just like hanging out, relaxing. And it was a story about their experiences and that kind of thing. And I think one of the reasons why I got that assignment is because I was about the same age as uh. some of these guys. Right. And so, yeah, it was great. I mean, I remember it very clearly. Like I, I you know, photographed some guys playing pool. And because I was doing it on slide, film i had to it was super dark in there i had to set up lights like these days you could just do it digitally and it yeah. would be fine you know you, you don't need light but in those days shooting like 100 is or asa slide film you needed to light it and i did and i i knew how to do that 
from my experience working, shooting slides that I've been doing since I was, you know, 16, 17 years old. So um, that was, and that picture ran in the magazine and it looked good. And I, I that's when I sort of felt, okay, I've at least got a foothold now in this, uh, in this industry. God, that has to be, um, that's got to be a great feeling. Um, I was introduced to Martha by a photographer who did work for Time Magazine, somebody I was assisting for. I got to see her. And then also the People Magazine photo editor was also in that same area. She was a German yes. woman. I can't remember her name. She was awesome too. Renata, um, I, maybe. Was that uh, was was it Renata Harhoff? Uh, I think or, no, so. Sorry, I'm thinking different magazine. My mistake. Yeah. Sorry. Okay. It was. Uh, she was super yeah. cool. She actually gave me assignments. I never got an assignment from Martha, but I love her. She was like the most open, nice, friendly, encouraging photo editor. Um, I don't know where she is today, but um, I definitely miss miss uh, being around her. Uh, and so yeah, me too. Yeah, she's still in she's still in L.A. Um, I haven't seen her in a while, but yeah. Excellent. That's good mm -hmm. to know. And mm -hmm. so let's go a little bit into U.S. news. How did mm -hmm. how did the affiliation with U.S. news? And for those who are tuning in from overseas or elsewhere who don't or or younger and don't remember a lot of how this worked, but there were three <clears throat> three primary news magazines in the U.S. Time, Newsweek, and U.S. News and World Report. And when, whenever I see your name or hear your name or see you or whatever, it just immediately in the drop down menu in my brain goes to U.S. News. How did that? come to be and were you actually on contract with them yeah i was and it's 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 actually a, a pretty pretty good story of how that came to be so i'd been freelancing for time a little bit less for for newsweek but it but at some point you know in those days at least a couple times a year i'd go to new york and visit photo editors and then one year i decided to go to washington dc where us news was based and meet them i had never done an assignment for them or really didn't know much about them uh but i i went down there and um had a nice meeting and then Two weeks later, the LA riots happened. And oh. I was, I was not, I was out of town at the time. I was a long drive away. And because I'd been working for time, my immediate thought was, well, I gotta let them know that I'm available as I was driving in to back into the city, basically in the middle of the night. And I called Martha and Martha told me that uh, they had a couple of people on. It was extremely dangerous. Uh, you know, they're there were some photographers that had gotten hurt in the early hours, you know, the first hours of the riots. And yep. she said, we just can't take you on at this moment. So like when it got to be about 830 in New York, I called my agent at the time. I was with Blackstar and I called uh, Ann Stack was sort of my rep at Blackstar. And Ann said, well, let me call U.S. News because you just met them and whatnot. So immediately she called me back and said, you're on for U.S. News. Now, five minutes later, Martha called me. And oh. said, you know what, can we put you on? And I said, I've, I'm sorry, I'm just committed to U.S. News, who I'd never shot for before. So those five minutes, you know, ended up being a huge difference because I ended up working uh, for U.S. News for about two solid weeks, um, you know, during the riots and afterwards. And uh, there was just so much work that over the next several months or, you know, I think they, they just decided to give me a contract. And I was I was the only west coast photographer for that magazine and uh you know they had maybe five staffers in washington and five contract photographers around the country and i became one of them and that was that was my main job for about a dozen years and so contract is it 100 days a year guaranteed mm -hmm. Yeah, it was 100 days a year guaranteed. It was, you know, if you went over, it was just, you know, you were just, you know, they'd, you'd be working as a, you know, extra day rates. And then, I mean, the great thing was, is that um, I had tremendous flexibility and I could work for anybody else um, except for Time and Newsweek. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, you know, if some other interesting assignment came up, as long as it wasn't conflicting with a U.S. news gig, I could take it for for other clients. And I was able to take time off and do personal projects. So it was a work setup that was so amazing. I didn't realize how great it was, especially until it was over. Uh, but um, but it was wonderful. And it, and it you know, took me all around the United States and, and to a lot of places around the world that I wouldn't have gone to otherwise. So in essence, what it's doing with strip the photography away, financially, it's providing you a foundation where you say to yourself, I'm okay for the year. I'm not getting rich. I'm okay for the year. And then everything else is on top of this. 
And, and as a photographer, that has to be the best feeling in the world to just feel that weight of the financial, like, oh my God, how am I going to make a living? That's mm -hmm. taken care of, which in turn, my guess is makes contractors better photographers because you don't have the financial fear, financial insecurity. And then like you said, so did they embargo your work uh, at all or was that... Um, um, well, I mean, I think they embargoed it for the U.S. market, at least for some period of time. Um, but I think depending, you know, this is pre-web, right? So, I mean, a, a U.S. magazine is really, you know, it, it's hardly going to show up overseas. You know, they may have had some overseas <laughs> editions, but um, no, I don't, I don't think it was embargoed so much for like the European market. So if I shot something that was international news, my agency was able to get it out, um, you know, in the secondary market. Um, yeah. So, and yeah, it, and, yeah and so, so you were at Black Star originally. And then it, well, if I remember to bring this up later, you then went on to different agencies. And I think that's an interesting angle that I don't have in the questions. But you said mm -hmm. uh, something a minute ago, which was um, the contract allowed you to work for anybody else except Time and Newsweek, but also allowed you to do personal projects. And anytime I see your name, and especially what's happening in the current context in China, when I see the word Uyghur or anything about the Uyghur population, was was your documentary project on the Uyghurs, was that during your time at US News? And it also looks like it, you shot on 35 black and white film. And was this, a, is, was this a reaction to being forced to shoot color or was it just a throwback to your origins as a, as a black and white photographer? I, I think it was more the latter. And yes, you're right about the timing. And so, in fact, that whole trip was sparked by U.S. News, even though it wasn't for them. But one of the the bosses at, that I had at the magazine sort of in an offhand made an offhand comment sometime. He's like, oh, well, maybe we'll send you to China for a couple of weeks just to sort of kick around and see what you come up with. And I thought, well, that sounds pretty good. Um, <laughs> but that, you know, that assignment didn't materialize. But in in the interim, I had gone out and I'd bought a Lonely Planet guide to China. So I was like flipping through it. And I saw in there, uh, you know, a picture of these people who didn't seem so Chinese and they're praying outside of a mosque in Western China. And it had never occurred to me that they're Muslims in China. And who is this group of people called the Uyghurs? And so I started reading about it and it just it just sounded so interesting and so exotic to me. And I had been to China very briefly, very quickly when I was in college um, on, on just sort of right before I graduated. I went with my photo mentor, Ed Hill, who I happened to have seen a couple of weeks ago, which was fantastic. Uh, but Ed had planned out this trip and we went to several countries in Asia. And I ended up kind of at the very end of the trip by myself, Ed and I kind of parted ways because we got on each other's nerves, but I ended up <laughs> by, by myself in Chengdu, China for five or six days trying to get out of there and get to Hong Kong. Um, and that was my experience with China. So anyway, when I found out about the Uyghurs, I was like, no, I want to, I want to go and do this. And I'm, for whatever reason, immediately I thought about doing it in black and white. And I think a large part of that was to get back to sort of like how I started a photographer, which was shooting Tri-X, you know, just very simple couple of lenses and that's it. And, um, yeah, that ended up being probably, you know, not it, probably, it was my first really great first, you know, uh, personal project. Absolutely. Yeah. So I made two trips there, you know, 98 and 99, I think. Yeah. I think, I don't remember where you and I met. Um, mm -hmm. Maybe it was 96 San Diego political convention. I remember seeing yeah. you there and I, I that could be it. I don't really, mm -hmm. it had to be somewhere in California. Yeah. But I also remember when you did the Uyghur project and I was like, Wow, mm. this you know it has. I and I looked at it again a couple of days ago. It's just work that's timeless work that holds up. It it looks like it could have been shot, you know, so far back in in the past. And also to see what's happening with the Uyghur population today, I think there's a lot of people that have tried to do that project in recent years. Some people have done it rather successfully, but whenever and when anyone asks me about that story, I always say you have to reference what Buteau did, you know, in mm. the '90s on that. Um, well, I mean, I, I, I'm revisiting that work right. I mean, like right now, actually, and and trying to figure out exactly what I want to do with it. So, yeah, I'm glad you mentioned it. Yeah, it's a really it's a super solid body of work. And um, and again, based on what's happening right now, it's something that and I, I, I think what you your realization about Muslims living in China 
when you had that in the 90s is still something that happens to a huge percentage of people today that just don't equate Muslims with China. So it's a, it's a very educational piece as well. We, we've danced around this a little bit, um, and I'm going to change my, my uh, order of questions here, but maybe it's because I was, I was never at, as a photographer, I was never at your level and I never had your, your success in terms of contracts and all assignments and things like that. 99.9% of anything decent I've ever done in photography was personal. It's all personal projects. The assignments I did were like immediately, I just forgot about them for the most part after I did them. But for you, you've had real success with assignments and personal projects, but what's the ratio of, of success in your mind based on those two groups? And has that shifted in recent years to being more personal project successes versus professional? I th I think the ratio for me is, I mean, if you know, it sort of de depends on how you define success. But if I'm just defining it for my own um, sense of uh, progress and and sort of creative uh, gratification, I would say uh, it's it's mostly it's, it has come from assignments. And I think I got very lucky with that U.S. news contract. And again, for a lot of your viewers who this is sort of predates their you know, uh, experience with, with weekly news magazines, but time was the biggest and they had the most money. Newsweek was kind of like somewhere a little bit below and U S news was sort of the scrappy, you know, yeah. uh, small kid on the playground because they didn't have the same budgets and they didn't have the same, uh, you know, they didn't have as many contract photographers. Um, but what happened was, is that, you know, they had a, 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 a you know, a, fewer photo editors. So I ended up working with the same people, but, you know, very aggressive. And when they decided to, you know, to put some effort into something, they really did it. And so, you know, I would have, you know, two week assignments for them, something that's practically unheard of today. And they, they fostered that creativity and the whole point of having uh, one of us go and do something knowing that both the wire services were going to be there and other magazines were, were going to be there was to get something different. So we were encouraged to try to kind of um, expand our own personal vision when we were doing these assignments. And God, uh, you know, I was able to go to a lot of places, um, you know, essentially on the magazine's dime, but shoot the way I wanted to shoot. And so that I still think of that today whenever I'm on assignment, at least for those sorts of things where there's some creative uh, flexibility. I mean, it's the dream scenario. That, that's it what every, every single photographer that was in my situation or our situation, that's exactly what you wanted was to be able to work for someone like that who was scrappy that said, go do what it is that you do in particular. Yeah. Just off the top of your head, who were, the, who were your contemporaries, your peers at the time that you would look at and sort of judge yourself against? You know, you had the the Ron Havivs and the Chris Morris and the Alexandra Avakian, and you had um, uh, I forget her name from Seven as well, who's no longer with us. Um, there were tons of good people working at the time, but like who who did you look at consistently look at uh, as a contemporary? Well, you know, those names that you mentioned, those were all people that I, I, I looked at and, and I was kind of in awe of, frankly. You know, I think that, you know, maybe in terms of contemporary photographers, James Noctway was the first person that I, you know, started to appreciate, I think, as I was kind of learning photojournalism. And then, you know, uh, yeah, absolutely. Like during the war in the Balkans, you know, what, what Chris and what Ron were doing was just you know, amazing work. And I, I found kind of early on that I wasn't, you know, I went to a couple of conflict situations and I realized that I just didn't have just, just from a personal, uh, you know, ability and, and, you know, being able to overcome your fear, I just couldn't work at the same level uh, as the people that you mentioned, for example. So, I, you know, I was, I realized I, I'm going to have to try to do something different. Um, Ken Jureski was somebody who, yep. uh, who was also a big influence and who I really appreciated. So I was thinking of them, you know, of, of him also at the time. Um, I found, yeah, I mean, uh, I found Deeds of War at the half price at the UT co-op bookstore in Austin. I saw Deeds of War. I'd never heard of Jim Nactway. And then I saw that and I was like, oh crap, look at that guy. And then Jureski did that book on the Gulf War, Just Another War with Just Henry Rollins. War. Yeah. And I was like, oh crap. You know, that guy, that guy did that as well. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I got mm -hmm. I got shot at in Austin 
during my photo program while working on a project in East Austin. And I, there was like a 20 second period where I have no idea what I did other than hide. And, <laughs> and I somehow got myself between the two parties who were shooting each other. And I had a 24 with a strobe on. So every time I was firing, it was, you know, basically pinpointing my location because of the strobe. And I was like, after that moment, I was like, you know, I don't know if, I don't know if this photojournalism thing, maybe, yeah. maybe documentary photography would be a better like choice. Long for form. Me. That's what I'm interested in. Yes. <laughs> Just an, an instant flip. Like, okay. Yeah. Uh, what'd you, what'd yeah, you shoot? It's, uh, it's, nothing. it's a bit of a blow to the ego too. When that, when that stuff happens. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> uh, okay. So we still, we, st we've, I think we've been talking for almost an hour. We still have a ton of stuff to talk about. I'm so sorry. You feel free. No, to no, no. It. It's, it's good. I love this. It's, we haven't had, we haven't had to catch up and I don't think you and I, we've never spoken about this stuff before. We just were, no, you know, no, no, more no. friends than anything else. Okay. The internet and social media arrives and obviously the internet came quite a bit prior to social, but there is no doubting that the internet and social had a profound impact on you as a human being, me as a human being, as and our profession and the industry and the world itself. How do you even begin to address the impact on, on your career that those two things had? Yeah, it, it it's the huge, it's a huge topic. And it's probably the, you know, it I, I wouldn't say probably, it is the most significant change uh, in the field of, you know, certainly in the field of photojournalism. And in some ways, uh, it's been a, a big negative in the sense that the when media and news went primarily online, just from business standpoint, you know, the advertising revenue that these places were getting from putting content on the web versus a print magazine was huge. And obviously, it's much, much less than like, you know, in the, in the days of print. So as print started to decline... Then, you know, in, in terms of revenue and their ability to do it long form assignments and things like that. At the same time, you had like digital photography uh, was getting better and it became technically easier to take good pictures. So that changed so much from the slide days. And then, you know, even when people started shooting color negative more, you know, so you didn't have to have that kind of like as much of a technical background to do photography. So um, that sort of like started to level the playing field in, in just the, from a technical standpoint. Um, so that meant more people were able to do it and it wasn't as expensive to go off and shoot stuff. Like if you're shooting 20 or 30 rolls of slide film for a personal project and you have to get them process that processed, you know, that's like hundreds and hundreds of dollars, right? You know, yep. you're getting to the thousands maybe. Um, also, and you know, an interesting thing is like when I was shooting overseas assignments um, in the film days, if you were on deadline, you'd call this place or, uh, you know, I did call World Courier, which is what U.S. News used, and, and you'd be in some tea shop somewhere in the middle of nowhere in a foreign country, and there'd be a, uh, somebody, a courier that would just show up and pick up your film and take it to the airport, you know, and then it would be put on a plane to New York or Washington. Amazing, right? It, um, amazing. But, but that was expensive, right? So the magazine was paying for it. But you couldn't really do that as a freelancer, right? So, but now with digital and you get your stuff out electronically and everybody can do it, you know, that means that other, you know, many photographers situation and in terms of just getting their work out um it's no more expensive for for a freelancer working with their laptop than a professional who's on assignment um so you've got that okay so that meant that the types of assignments uh were changing the budgets were getting smaller and there was more competition that's the downside i mean this is a big subject right but yeah just to yeah agree, that's the downside to me the upside is I'm getting to see more photographers work, you know, whether it's online or whether it's an Instagram. So before when you had just like these three major US news magazines, I'm sorry, are you about to say something or no, you want no, to no. go? Okay. Uh, so when you had, you know, three, you know, major US news magazines, and then you've got a couple of foreign magazines, you know, like French, you know, like Paris Match, for example. So everybody's looking at this, but it's kind of hard to get published in those magazines, particularly if you're not on assignment. So you'd see photographers out working scenes, but you'd never actually see what they were getting, or most of them, you wouldn't see what they were producing. And that's all changed now. People can self-publish their work on their website or on, you know, you see it on Instagram. So you follow these people. So I think my personal view is that as a result, people are kind of 
challenging each other in ways that they didn't before, you know, and I think that's been great for the profession because I think also because digital photography, like the technical aspects have gotten easier. I think it's allowed people to become more experimental in the way that they shoot, because you kind of know that you're going to get the picture in focus and properly exposed. You don't have to worry about that anymore. So you can start look, looking for, look for things, you know, in the scene that are going to be more interesting and you don't have to worry about using up the roll of film that's in your camera to do it. You just keep doing it, you know, until you feel like maybe you've got it. <clears throat> and um, I, you know, I think just, I just think the, the, the sort of the average, you know, the, 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 the middle level of photography has been greatly elevated because of those things. And I'm really appreciative of that. And I love, you know, I follow photographers from around the world on IG and I just love seeing what people are doing. And I think it's a, a lot of it, most of it is much more interesting than what I was doing 20 years ago, for example. So I feel like, you know, I, I got to, you know, I, I want to try to keep up. I mean, I get, to your point, this is a huge topic that we could talk about forever. I, I, I can't stand Instagram. I deleted my account in 2014, mm. but I have a whole, uh, you know, other philosophy about that. But this brings me to the next question. And then I want to start talking a little bit about your book, Brink, that came out a year ago about the January 6th, whatever you want to call it, that happened at the U.S. Capitol, which I find incredibly fascinating, one of the most important, interesting events in, in really uh, U.S. history. But there's a big difference now, and this is something that having been on YouTube for a short time and sort of th tossing out some knowledge that I had about things in the past that I thought, I, I think that there's there's a, there's a lot of gray area involved in the difference between a photographer and an influencer. And so I think when I meet with, tip, particularly when I'm looking like reviewing portfolios of young photographers, or I'm talking to young photographers on YouTube or on my site or wherever, They'll often, when I'll say, well, who's, in, you know, who's basically a photographer that you're watching? Many times they don't come back with photographers. They come back with influencers. And there, to me, there's a huge difference between those two. Typically, you can have a photographer that's also a, works as an influencer because of the work that they're creating just happens to influence most often other photographers in the industry not so much the general public. And then you have people who have dedicated their lives to being influencers who, who may or may not have ever had any engagement with the actual industry of photography. They've never, maybe never done an assignment, but they've, they're professional community builders on, on Instagram. They know how to build community. It seems like, and maybe I'm wrong about this, but it seems like early on in your career, let's, let's take the US news era, that 12 years or whatever it was, and you're in the field shooting, there was far less demand on you to self-promote and also to promote that work because the magazine was doing that job. Now, all these years later, you're freelancer, you're out there, you're your own ecosystem now. So now you've got to walk this parallel line of, yes, I've got to create work, but I've also got to create my own buzz. Is that accurate or am I? did I hit my head earlier? Well, no, I, 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 I agree with everything you said. I mean, I'm, I'm not sure, you know, I mean, I create, creating my own buzz, uh, you know, it's something I, I, you know, that's, I think that's part of it in the sense that, you know, you, you don't want to get, you, you don't want your work to get lost in all, in all the noise, but yes, I mean, there are a lot of people who are just great at sort of self-promotion and social media, and maybe their work is not that interesting, but it's, uh, you know, they have these other skills that get them popular, right. um, you know, tens of thousands of followers. So, you know, I, I, I don't think that I particularly have those skills and I don't really have the interest in doing that either. Um, and so in a sense, you know, I'm hoping that the work sort of speaks for itself and that will, to some extent, make up for my skills as a, as an influencer or wannabe or whatever. Um, and I'm not, you know, I'm not bagging on anyone, but it's just, it's a, it's a different thing. And I think another yeah. dynamic, you know, I think another dynamic that's part of that is that before the web and sort of the social media, you know, at these different magazines, you had often well-known photo editors who kind of served as, let's say gatekeepers or curators in a sense. Uh, for photography. So, you know, to get published, you had to go through somebody else, right? Yeah. Who was kind of validating your work. Now that doesn't exist. Um, I mean, there's still validation that happens, but you don't need that. So if, if you're good at self-promotion, you don't need somebody else to validate it. 
Um, well, it's interesting because, you know, you just admitted something that to me is a pretty, it's it's kind of a profound thing in 2023 where you said, you know, look, I don't really have any particular interest in being an influencer or self-promoting like that. I want the work to speak for itself. That is so 1995, by the way. But, and I see this one of two ways. One, I absolutely love that that was your response. Because I've seen so many photographers go from being good photographers to being basically like Instagram self-promoters and their work changes. And I often see photographers go from being photographers to content producers because content gets more traction online than photography does. I just think that that's – I mean a, a photographer was on my couch two days ago. He said if I post a really great photograph on Instagram, I don't get anybody any likes. But if I post that certain kind of content, I can get whatever I want. And he said it drives me crazy, and I think there's a lot of people in that boat. The one thing that I'm curious about is that when I look at the future of, of photojournalism and I look at the future of photography in general, what's interesting to me now are the people who have built their own ecosystems. They're people that have ma online followings, but they're not based through any other platform. They're based through their own platform. So email newsletters with 20, 30, 40,000 subscribers, mm -hmm. websites, um, they're, they have printing arms, they have sort of a marketing arms. They have collaboration. They're taking assignments. So I look at what you're doing. I look at the skill level you have. And I think to myself, man, like you've already got a lot of the bricks in place to build this foundation. What would it take to flip you into someone that says, yeah, I'm going to do this. And then, you know, people are going to be coming to me, but the people coming to you may be different from the people that were coming in the past. So, you know, right. what, I'm, you know what I'm saying? Sure. No, I'm I'm open to that, and well, yeah, we should have this conversation once you uh, hit the stop button on record. You know, yeah. because uh, you know, I think there's there's a lot to learn there, and it's and it's it's like a whole new set of skills. And so, yeah, I mean, I'm not, I I wasn't, you know, trying to bag on influencers. I mean, to me, ultimately, it's you know, but you, you know, is it is that I'm doing this because I love photography, and that's yeah. that's just my bones but i think to, you know to your point just as a practical matter you still have to make a living and if and if kind of creating your own uh ecosystem you know and it gets could get defined as being an influencer well that that that's fine as long as you're yeah. as long as you like what you're shooting so absolutely yeah I, I, you said it earlier um i and i have i have this conversation a lot on youtube but being an influencer, building influence, building community is a separate set of skills. And the people that do it well are masterful at it, whether it's YouTube or IG or TikTok or whatever, they are masterful at building it. And it is a completely separate set of skills that I think a lot of people from our generation never had because that was never a task in front of us. Yes. And so all of us are playing catch up, but at the same time, there's something inherent in knowing that there's a line that you cannot cross. Because I think it's why so many influencers end up with with mental health issues is because if you're walking that line of living a facade, yes, it may gain following in the short term. In the long run, eventually they're gonna somebody's gonna come calling and say, "Look, this isn't really who you are." Um, there have been a couple examples of really successful YouTubers over the past couple of years that just you know hit the wall in epic fashion. And I look at it and say, you know, one, I am blown away by what you were able to accomplish. It is incredible. Change the face of communications worldwide. But at the same time, you knew at some point they were gonna, there was going to be a reckoning. And it's, um, you know, I think there's a way for you to build this without ever having to cross that line, which is when we can talk about that, like you said, off uh, when we're stop recording. Uh, I, I have to get to this because there's, so, I have another 10 questions to ask you, which I'm not going to get to, but January 6th, We'll go 2020. We'll go down in history, obviously, as a, a a significant monumental event in American history. And you happened to be in the Capitol building on that day, and you have released a book. A book came out a year ago called Brink, which looks fantastic. The reviews are incredible. Um, first of all, congratulations on that. How, where do I even start here? How did you get in there, and what was the experience? Okay, well, so January six was sort of the um, the culmination of work uh, that I've been doing on U.S. politics for four years. So during the 2016 campaign, I was 
kind of shocked actually how much traction Donald Trump had gotten. And then once he won the Republican nomination, I went um, I went to Cleveland for the GOP convention. Um, and I I thought it was a I having been to other political conventions that one to me was just the most bizarre. Um, so in the weeks leading up to the election, I was I was very interested to explore like where this where the sort of Trump phenomenon was coming from. So just out of personal curiosity and just a, a photographic you know, desire to, to try to get some feel for this. I went out to the Midwest for five or six weeks to, you know, during, uh, to these battleground states to cover the, you know, the campaign rallies and then just try to get a sense of sort of the social feel for this environment, for some of these Rust Belt communities that were, you know, had often previously voted for Democrats that were now Trump supporting, you know, areas you know, in the rural, you know, urban divide and all that. So that's really where it started. And then when Trump, but the thing was, you know, I had joked to some friends that if, if Trump won, and I didn't think he was going to win, that I would move to Washington to get a front row seat to the apocalypse. Ha ha. <laughs> that was my joke. Okay. And so when it actually happened, I was like, well, damn, maybe I should actually do it. And even though I'd, you know, been covering public policy, like my whole career as a photojournalist, I'd never worked in Washington, DC. I, I don't even know if I'd ever been to the Capitol before, you know? So it's like, I wanted to try that out and just see that, see what it was like. So I went for a few months, kind of on and off, staying with some family friends. And I found that it was really interesting. And I wanted to photograph like these peripheral scenes. What are the things that you don't see, you know, when you're watching the Comey hearing, what's off to the side, what's out of the frame of the TV cameras. And then I just decided to move there and stay there um, through the rest of the Trump administration. And I didn't know it was going to be four years, but, you know, uh, uh, eventually I, you know, I found myself on the West steps of the Capitol, you know, early in the afternoon on January 6th, while all that was going down. And that, uh, you know, after that experience, I realized, you know, this is that this is a significant arc, you know, in American history. And I don't know where it's going, but that's then I decided this work must be compiled into a book. But the experience, I mean, just getting back to the day itself. No, it, it blew my mind. I mean, um, there were a lot of aspects about it that, you know, that were sort of, you know, frightening, just, you know, personally, just being there it wasn't the scariest thing that I've been around, but it was nerve wracking. And then just, but my overarching feeling about the whole day was I cannot believe this is happening. And just standing there, just as a person, just watching it unfold, a person who's interested in, in history, um, seeing this, realizing that I'm witnessing firsthand a historical event that people are going to be talking about, you know, hundreds of years from now. And Absolutely. how quickly into the shoot did you realize things were going sideways? Quickly. I mean, you know, the rally started down on the mall close to the White House and the Washington Monument, like late in the morning. And then I took the sub. I knew that everybody was going to march to the Capitol. So when Trump started speaking, I like I just walked to the subway and and went to one of the office buildings that the photographers use on Capitol Hill. And as soon as just to sort of like put my stuff down, get organized, have a bite to eat. But basically, as soon as I got there, someone came in and said, you know, this thing is already kicking off. So that was about that was just after 1 p.m., I think. So that's when I went out of the, that building to the, you know, to the west front of the Capitol itself and started working immediately. And at that point, you know, there were already, you know, thousands of people that were converging onto the steps and they were already doing battle with the police at that point. So it, it was immediate, you know, um, knowing that this was, you know, and you had no idea how things were going to turn out, but it was clearly a significant thing. And yes. two, two questions. Did you get your ass kicked? And number two, um, uh, what do you, Not what does it feel like when, you hear people say, oh, it was just a regular day. You know, there was no riot. There was no fighting. There was no danger. Nobody got hurt. It was a regular day. I mean, you have a book as a test testament, testimony to what it actually was. But one, did you get your ass kicked? And two, how do you feel about that? No, I'm, I feel very fortunate that I didn't get my ass kicked. And, you know, there had been a couple of Trump rallies in Washington after the election prior to January 6th. There were two of them. So I went to both of those rallies and I had a sense of um, uh, a, a kind of a, a little bit of the dynamic and, and how to I mean, just part of this is just from experience, how to how to dress 
just, uh, you know, just getting down to the basics so that I'm maybe not, I'm certainly not looking like uh, somebody from Antifa or whatever. I'm like, I'm wearing this khaki Levi's jacket, you know, I've got a skateboarding helmet and a gas mask. You don't really know, like, it's you know, so superficially, you can't tell which side I'm on. Okay. Um, I also had a, I, uh, that day on January 6th, I wore, I wore two press passes. One was my Capitol Hill press pass and my other that's from the Senate. And my other was like Trump rally, like March for Trump that I had kept from the previous rally in December. And so I had that. And so somebody just looking at me, they don't really know. I mean, a lot of people did ask me who I'm photographing for. And I told them the truth, which was I'm working for my agency called Redux, which nobody has ever heard of, you yeah. know, and I might say if they're you know, trying to probe, I might say, you know, my pictures could just end up anywhere. Okay. But my strategy is just to get out of every conversation as quickly as possible. Right. Cause for yeah. my own safety and cause I I'm there to work and take pictures. So um, fortunately I escaped uh, anything like that, a direct, you know, you know, getting targeted or whatever. Um, and then, uh, no, my experience, you know, you know, in the afternoon and I spent, almost all of the time on the West steps for various reasons that will, you know, take too long to explain. But uh, I didn't really know what was happening inside the building until much later in the afternoon. I couldn't see like, and I was, I wouldn't say I was sort of stuck, but in a way I found a place where I could work, where I was fairly protected. I wasn't, I had, I had a metal rail next to me. I thought, well, if the crowd retreats in a stampede, which I thought was actually very likely, I'm going to be protected by this rail next to me. So I was able to, you know, work and, um, uh, but the level of violence was something that just blew my mind actually. And the vitriol that was expressed against the police, you know, both the DC metropolitan police and then the Capitol police just blew me away because these were the same people that for the last several months, you know, particularly this was like the month, this was the, the months after the BLM protests. And these people prior, prior to January 6th had been all about, let's back the blue. They were very pro-police. So suddenly here they are doing battle with the police. And that alone was weird, right? Um, you know, yeah. Redux is going to be pissed at you for saying that none of the rioters knew knew the agency. <laughs> just, I'm just I'm just putting that out there. Okay, so yeah. let's let's fast forward to the book. You're you're working with Punctum Press, which yeah. ends up doing this book called Brink. First of all, how did you approach them, or they approached you? And I, I, what what was the timeline, the publishing cycle? Was it did it take a year for the book to be completed? Eighteen months? What was it? Yeah, it was it was a um, it was a less than a year. And so no, I I, I approach I approach Punxsum, and they're they're based in Rome, and uh, they they just the the I, you know I I thought if I could print in Italy, I thought this is the best case scenario. Um, I mean, one of the things about the book was I mean it was really after January six, and then you had all these National Guard troops like like sleeping on the floor of the Capitol, you know, for two weeks prior to. Biden's inauguration. I mean, this whole thing was just such a one-off. It was just so odd. And because I had started photographing this whole thing before the 2016 election, I felt like I had this narrative arc that must be put into book form. And the whole point of it was to create um, a single body of work that, that a viewer would experience in a way that was completely different from just seeing stuff on the web looking at things on their laptop. So, you know, I wanted nice printing. I wanted matte paper. I wanted the whole format of the experience to be radically different from what people had been seeing for the last four years, especially if you're going to make them look at all these pictures over, you know, um, uh, this, you know, the subject again. So, um, you know, I think I started um, doing an edit, uh, actually, even before the end of, uh, you know, even right after the election, I thought I need to start looking at this work. And I enlisted the help of Jen Poggi, who was one of my editors at U.S. News, who's now at uh, Rochester Institute of Technology. And uh, so Jen helped me go like down from hundreds of pictures to a few hundred. And then I brought in Olivier Picard, who was also an editor at U.S. News and World Report. So when I was talking about those days and the kind of like encouragement to um, explore my creative freedom, those were two of the editors that fostered that. So I brought them in to help me with this process. And it was really the three of us doing the editing. Uh, so essentially I had you know, sort of a halfway completed edit when I went to Punctum 
And then we talked about the format of the book, the size and all that. And then over the next few months uh, from basically January of 2020 to maybe uh, April uh, and May, we got the picture editing down, uh, commissioned two uh, essays, two other writers to contribute to it. I wrote a piece myself. And um, and then the production happened fairly quickly. I mean, part of it is that I wanted it to happen quickly. And yeah. Because Punctum had a very close relationship with their printer in Rome. We, you know, they were able to like hit the start button, uh, you know, very efficiently. Who did the design? It was a combination. I did a lot of the design myself. Uh, Jen helped me. Uh, I have another friend named David Brady, who's an artist and a book designer in Phoenix. He helped me. And then some of the design was done um, in, in Rome by uh, by Punctum's designer. It, that's interesting. Uh, it's, you know, yeah. I, I always tell people uh, putting a book out into the world is not a sole, uh, sole proprietorship. It's a team that, that get, you know, you have to have experts and all of those things. It's not like you bang it out and literally, you know, buy some ink and print it yourself. So that's interesting. How many copies did you print? 700. 700. Okay. And is it, um, are, are you getting it into libraries or, th I mean, the beauty, and this is really a question to you, which is, um, and I'll never forget this when I first went on YouTube and I started talking about, um, archiving photographs, the, the, the value and importance of having a good accessible archive, and then also print. And this guy wrote me and said, you're a complete idiot. This is the digital age. Nobody, nobody cares. And I was like, that's hilarious. Number one. And I love YouTube comments. It's probably the best thing about being on YouTube. But, you know, and if you grew up in the online world, maybe that would seem like a realistic thing. But every photographer I know wants a book deal. It's still to this day. I mean, I'm looking right here. I got Dan Winter's Road to Seeing, Charles Arnaldi, the artist. I got Steidel's Spring Summer 21, 2021 catalog. This is still like the feather in the hat that everybody wants. Mm -hmm. With with a particular story like this, like what's happened of that, you know, this time in political history in America, it's even more important. What's your do you have an end game goal with this? But what's the yeah. what's the dream scenario for your book? Yeah, you know, absolutely. I mean, I think that from the very beginning, my intention was to, to I, I mean, my my primary goal really was to create this historical record that would end up in libraries or, or magazines or, you know, political institutions and, uh, you know, um, just other learning institutions, historical groups and things like that. So, you know, have that be a combination of places like that and then just ordinary people who want to have the book as part of their own collection. But it's really, it was, you know, very much to create a, a record and, you know, something that was interesting to look at will hopefully be interesting to look at like a hundred years from now. And so in part, the way the style of shooting that I did, um, or I should say photographing during the, uh, you know, during this period when I was working in Washington, it was, it was designed in a sense, necessarily not to work on the web or not to work on Instagram, but really to, to, to work in a book format. I was shooting a little bit looser. You know, I want these images to be big. I want it to be, give people in the future a feel for what this time was like and to be able to look inside the picture at all these little his details that in the future will be interesting just like we'll look at a picture you know that's a hundred years old and you're interested like what are people wearing what's the technology and stuff like that so oh i just saw some work from martin chambi the peruvian photographer and yeah you i can't look at that work and not just want to immediately get on a plane uh, and mm. go to Peru. So mm. we have to br draw this to an end. I have so many questions that we mm. didn't get to about your process in the field, about what you're looking for with with photographs, how you work in the field, how you work a scene. Where is all this going? You mentioned the importance of bringing in two people to help you edit your book. Um, the the importance of having full time picture editors really polish what it is you're putting together. I have a great story about Blurb working with Chris Boot several years ago, and he did an edit that absolutely just blew my mind. It will forever be seared into my head of how he pulled that off. Uh, but how we're going to have to do like a chapter two of this at some point because um, this is it's getting dangerously long. So how can people find you, and how can they find the book? Great. Well, so you can find me uh, easily. My name is David Buto and it's spelled B-U-T-O-W. So it's just my name.com. And then I'm, I am on Instagram and, um, you know, we'll, we'll, we can talk about that sometime. Sorry about that. But 
Um, you know, a lot of these pictures, I'll, I'll say in, in defense of your position of Instagram though, you know, a lot of these pictures don't work well, uh, when they're that small, it's almost like they're designed to be seen large so that, uh, you know, I think Instagram has changed in some ways, maybe not for the better, the way people take pictures, but, um, uh, so you can find me there. I'm, you know, I'm on Twitter. I don't use Twitter all that much, but, uh, you know, there are not a lot of David Butos out there in the world. So, and, and, and what, what about the book? You'll, you'll see it on the website. So it's available on, from my website. And then it's also okay. on Amazon. Man, thank you so much for doing this. I had an absolute blast talking to you. I'm, I've followed your career since I, you know, first met you all those years ago. And I think you're one of the good guys in the industry. And, um, I'm always impressed by what it is you're pulling off. Jealous would be another word. There's been plenty of days where I, you know, cursed you privately, but um, yeah, I really appreciate ways, you. <laughs> so, <laughs> absolutely. No, you, I, appreciate yeah, I mean, your, your, your constant drive and your creative output is uh, I'm kind of in awe of that truly. So lots of coffee, lots of coffee. All right, yeah. man. Well, thank you so Working. much. And, right. um, and hopefully we will uh, see you soon down the road. Great to see you, dude. Thank you.